Hello. So I'd like to start tonight by stating that any suggestion that WGCA has had a party vibe over the last few months is totally false. I've always considered WGCA to be a work event rather than a source of fun, and I've always stuck to the guidelines of what an FPL podcast should be. I wasn't told by any of our previous co-hosts, guests or anything, that we could be having what was considered to be a party vibe, could be breaking the rules, or anything like that at any point. So basically, we'll see what Sue Gray says, but as far as I'm concerned... There was a party vibe, but there wasn't a party vibe. But if there was a party vibe, I wasn't aware of it being a party vibe. And if there was a party vibe, I wasn't told that it wasn't in the rules. Hope that clears it all up. Thank you very much. We are Who Got the Assist. I'm Tom. You can find me on Twitter at WGTA underscore FPL. And my co-host is Anthony at FPL Stag. You are right, Anthony? How are you? Good, thanks. All good, thanks, Tom. Waiting for that report indeed. But uh, in the meantime, I'll just bask in the glory of a game week which included an Adam Eda goal versus Everton what a moment it was for Norwich but for Adamita for Cork for Ireland for everyone um, it was a great moment and I hopefully that starts him off scoring many many more goals and lifting Norwich out of the relegation zone just for the lols uh, in the meantime this is obviously going to be a quick pod we are recording on a Wednesday night with weekend fixtures coming around the corner quite quickly so with that in mind we're going to do the usual um, dispensing with some of the leaderboards the market forces correspondence and all those things to reflect the tight timing that we have uh, so with that we're basically only dealing with a bunch of listeners questions which are looking at the upcoming game week 24 and indeed the game weeks that follow that but first of all we will start with a very brief attempt at the game week reviews um, the united game is finishing off websites are struggling to tell us how things are going so we can't really provide a very full update on that gimmick review. And I'm very glad that I, I, we can't provide an update for the game review because I don't want to talk about my team, Anthony. I sold Steer, Antonio and Son. I bought in Sanchez, Dennis and Madison. Yes, I bought Madison on Thursday night. My ability to buy Salah in one move was impacted by his projected price rise and Son's projected price fall. Yes, I know, I know. And I captained... Ronaldo over buying in Bruno. There was no world where I was buying. Uh, but th- th- there was, there's sim- I know, I know. There's, there's, there was simply no world um, that I was buying Bruno with Ronaldo in situ. That, that just wasn't going to happen. Um, so yeah, I mean, enjoy the captain points, guys. So if you if you do captain, then well done. And I've just, it just, I just, it just wasn't going to happen for me. Basically, there was just no kind of element of consideration outside of wild carding which i didn't really entertain last last week so yeah um another kind of quite harsh binary there and to top it off michael fucking keen uh minus two points started him because i thought hey you know it's norwich and i benched connor cody because i thought well southampton probably going to score of course cody then scores i think it's his second goal at molyneux ever um, so you've got a nice minus two from Michael Keane on the pitch, uh, nine points from Conor Cody on the bench, no returns anywhere to speak of other than Madison's goal. So, yeah, I think I'm going to end up on 52 minus eight. That's um, that's great. Um, I think some people, most people, I think Bruno scored more than, than my entire team. Uh-oh. And um, yeah, oh, no. yeah. Oh, so that's, that's me from 100k two weeks ago. So wait, what's your what's your t- your overall tally probably going to be in points? 50. You think? Uh, net probably about 46. Oh, oh goodness! Mm. Oh goodness! Yeah, so a proper, a proper, uh, big red arrow this week, but at least it means that I get some green arrows now to make myself feel better. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll That's t- not how it works. <laughs> we'll, I know we'll, we'll talk, we'll, t- we'll talk about overall enjoyment of the game later on because it's obviously a bit. It, it can be it's, it's very annoying when the 50s don't go your way that's for sure i, I don't even want to know what my rank is frank you know i probably won't look at it until next week uh when the weekend's games have been played because it's just a yeah a tough one to stomach and everything doesn't really go your way one week in contrast you've done very well Anthony. once yeah I, I suspect this might well have been the best game week of my whole entire season so far so I decided to pull the trigger and use my wildcard in the end. Uh, the wildcard squad that I had just for completeness, I had De Gea and Foster as my two goalkeepers, obviously starting De Gea this week. I picked five defenders, of course, Trent Alexander-Arnold, Veltman, Cancelo, Laporte and Kansa. I started three of them this week, Trent Alexander-Arnold, who I actually captained for 20 points, Veltman and Cancelo. I benched Laporte kind of thinking, OK, I don't want to necessarily double up on that City defence against Chelsea. Happy to have one of them on the pitch. And if Cancel- and if Laporte came in, he put him as first bench, then I'd have been fine with it. So in the end, I did bench his seven points this week. 
in my midfield, my five midfielders were Bowen, Jota, Rafinha, Bruno Fernandes and uh, Alan, who I couldn't let go of, even if all sense dictated that I should go for someone like Jordan Ramsey or somebody, you know, mm. Jacob Ramsey or somebody. There was just, there was no way that that was going to happen. A, a mascot the mascot at this point. Right? Yeah, the yeah. mascot. Yeah, that's exactly it. He is the mascot of this team. And so he'll stay there and maybe he'll get another fluky assist for me at some point. Um, Alan was obviously benched this week. Um, Bowen obviously returning happily. Jota with nothing. Rafinha with an assist, um, which could have done an awful lot more, to be honest, in that game. He's quite good. And obviously Bruno Fernandes with a haul to end all hauls um, in this double game week. Up front, then, the three strikers who I went with, basically with plans to sell most of them in the next two to three game weeks. Neil Mopé, six points. Cristiano Ronaldo, two points. And Emmanuel Dennis, two points. So I brought two of those um, particular players in. 94 points is a very good game week, this game week. Um, it's going to half my rank. Um, I don't have a projected rank because the websites are still trying to calibrate the what, the return of Bruno Fernandes effectively. Um, I was unfortunate maybe not to get a clean sheet out of De Gea in one of the two games, mostly in the second one, I guess. Um, but you kind of felt United were looking comfortable you know, well into both the um, Villa and Brentford games, having not looked comfortable before they got to their lead, but this is this is kind of beside from the point. Um, Beltman could quite easily have had a massive haul in game one against Crystal Palace. He was the one who was taken down for the penalty that was missed. Uh, and indeed, he would have had a clean sheet as well had uh, Crystal Palace basically scored with their, their single meaningful attack of the game. I don't know if that would be an overstatement to say. And Mopé, of course, had a, uh, a goal chalked off as well. Uh, as we Kansa is... Um, an issue for me going forward and that he's now injured he was the villa player that i was kind of i got in watkins or somebody else was to come but i brought him in and he of course went off injured um in the game um in his first game of the get double game week, or in the game weeks so I'm, I'm kind of concerned about him for the double game week that is to come but for now um this was a pretty good game week the trend captaincy worked out well i didn't want to go for the bruno captaincy even if i brought him in i appreciate some people did go for that captaincy fair play to them but when there was the chance that Ronaldo would play both games, we weren't to know that he wasn't going to play the first game. There was no way that I was going to captain Bruno um, with Ronaldo on the pitch. Uh, and even if I thought, I wouldn't have necessarily expected the ceiling for Bruno to have been two goals in a game where Ronaldo didn't play. Uh, so, look, that's okay. The single game week players that I had, was I could have really loaded up on double game week players, but kind of sticking to who's gone well and kept keeping the likes of Cancelo and Bowen and getting in even Rafinha worked out quite well as well. So look, it's a very, very good week. It, the I think the team is quite well set up going forward and we'll probably talk transfers and captaincy later and we definitely will. Um, but for now, it's nice to have had a good game week for sure. Yeah, much deserved. I think you're 31 points behind me now, which is... Uh, oh my word, yeah, that's, that's yeah. ridiculous. That's, that's how much this week has done really. Um yeah, it's uh, yeah, one of those. But your team looks very, very good indeed. Um, there's no way around that. And <laughs> it's full of, um, as you said, players just... who have got like uh, games in hand and things like that, which is always positive. And, um, you know, this might mean that like, whilst I might, I'm going to lose anything I ever, with any cash league I went into with you guys or whatever, I might win a manager of the month prize at the rate I'm going. <laughs> And oh, save, yeah. my, save myself from a bagel, which yeah. would be lovely. <laughs> you don't want that bagel, that's for sure. No. Somehow I'm, <laughs> th I'm 30 pounds up in the cash leagues. It's so amazing. Right. Um, objectives, um, they're on screen at the moment. I've grayed out your timings ones and play styles ones off last week. Uh, mm -hmm. Captaincies, transfers. Well, obviously, your transfers don't really count. You wild carded this week. But captaincy wise, I guess going with Trent uh, kind of goes against it, doesn't it? So I guess it was a uh, you know, Ronaldo. It was, I went CEO. with I went with the I went with the algorithms on this one, and basically I okay. Whilst the likes of Bruno and Ronaldo and some of the other double game week players were up ahead of them, I kind of felt like what we knew about the Watford game, for example, it seemed like they would have there was a risk that they wouldn't have their second game. When I was still making my team my transfers, we didn't know for certain if. Spurs would have a double game week and so Spurs players were ahead and of course then Bruno and Ronaldo these sorts of double game week players were all ahead but all of them had different kind of caveats and concerns about whether you know Bruno with Ronaldo is a very different prospect to Bruno alone for example and this sort of thing so actually when you kind of cut out all of that fog you kind of found that um, Trent Alexander-Arnold was right up there um, in the algorithms and so kind of on that basis I proceeded ahead with my hunch on him rather than going with any of the double game week players so I, I think on um <laughs> i'm going to argue anyway that i kept with that particular uh, captaining with the algorithm uh, 
objective for this year. And then I, I, the transfer one, yeah, I, I guess on a wild card, you can't say that that really applied, but I wasn't afraid to transfer out any elite player if I felt they dropped off. So I like, for example, I got rid of Rudiger, who's been in my squad for a long time and he'd be you know, elite as defenders. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Close enough. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, for me, captaincy, do what Mikel's captaincy algorithm tells you to do. Well, I did. Yet again, Captain Ronaldo. For yes, another blank. As, uh, uh, the, other, the other week I was gushing about Mikel and you said, oh, you know what? Maybe it's because captaining Salah was just a really, really bloody easy thing to do. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe that's the case. We, we'll see this this game week uh, how that goes going forward. Uh, transfers, fifty situation, take a hit. Well, I mean, this week's the the moves that I made they were all kind of ones where I, I felt like I kind of had to do it. Covering Dennis, I think it was probably worthwhile doing. Um, obviously, in the glaze of hindsight, that was a really stupid decision, but. I mean, it's hindsight, you know. Um, bringing in Madison earlier was probably a bad idea, obviously. Um, and bringing in a goalkeeper uh, for Ramsdale, who didn't have a game, was a good idea, even though he only washed his face. So, I mean, I kind of stayed with that. Take a chance on form, buying bandwagon in players. Well, I mean, the Bruno bandwagon did exist, but it was based on no form whatsoever. It was based on kind of the fixtures being good. And obviously that's worked out spectacularly well for those who went with it. But... Um, I, I, don't, I don't think any of my transfers were, were necessarily wrong. Uh, Madison was in good form. He did score. Um, obviously, unfortunately, didn't have the first game. Uh, the Brighton defence, yeah. okay, I, I needed a goalkeeper and I needed a goalkeeper who covered uh, Ramsdale's blanks. So that's why I got Sanchez, but from now with the wild cards, we'll come on to a little bit. And uh, Dennis, yeah, I mean, the form conservative throughout the season form in inverted commas before analysts FC come at my door with some pitchforks or maybe some spectacles, you know, just wielding the the, the arm of the spectacles trying to stab me in the neck. Uh, but yeah, uh, broadly kept to my objectives thus far. Um, we are going to skip over the league update and we're going to skip over the market forces. I'm sure it's going to be everybody buying in Bruno, uh, the return of the premiums, etc., etc. But hey, uh, we're going to move on instead to uh, the general questions this week. Uh, we did get a few of them, uh, just the timestamp as well. It is the evening of Wednesday, the 19th of January. Hello. And all of our answers are obviously within the context of this time frame. So if you're listening in the future, double game week's been confirmed. A huge injury has upended everything. Well, sorry, we can't really help you because our time machine isn't working. Instead, we can only speak to what's going on as we know at the moment. First question this week. Slightly tongue in cheek, but worth discussing. I think we do get this every now and again. I think it's definitely worth kind of just voicing over how we are of all these things. It's about general FPL enjoyment. I haven't just thrown this in because of me. Like you know, I did all this earlier on today, and I assumed, I hoped that Ronaldo was going to do something tonight to make it feel a little better, take the edge off, you know. Um, but Chris at Chris MCR101, a man we know as Noli, asks, why do I keep playing this god-awful game? Why? Just why? <laughs> and uh, I, I think there'll be many uh, managers who are thinking that at the moment, uh, even though it appears on Twitter and appears in my group chats and appears everywhere else. Everybody own Bruno. The reality is obviously the usual phenomenon of those who are doing well piping up and those who aren't doing very well, not saying very much. I think there's a definite gap between the hardcore and the not, though, this whole kind of pandemic stop starty uncertain time sort of time frame we're seeing a continued drop off engage off a drop off of engagement in all areas and across the spectrum i think and i think you know it isn't a typical of a normal season so normally interest dro drops off around november december sort of time but i think it has been heightened a little bit by all the uncertainty. I haven't got numbers to compare, but I'm sure there'll be more dead teams at this time of the season than normal. And you can see it throughout, you know, the mini leagues at work and things like that. There are so many more dead teams than there normally would be. And I, you know, to bring it back to me, talk about myself for a second. I've certainly had my struggles recently, a bit low after this week, as you can probably tell, not my usual... Uh, uh, Sort of rambunctious self, um, and this week hasn't. Obviously, I didn't. I didn't own Bruno. I didn't consider Bruno, so I can't really get too kind of upset about that. But last week, Bowen versus Antonio, the fifty-fifty, and uh, Kai Havertz over Mo in game week nine. Both of those 50-50s can make or break your season to some extent. Um, and it can be a bit annoying when those things don't go your way. It doesn't upset me as much. You know, I'm a grown man, uh, but it does lead me to feel fed up a bit. Each one of these I fail to get basically means I'm a little bit further away from my target of a half-decent finish. And 
I guess maybe kind of speaking to why you wildcard a little bit, and maybe, which maybe we should speak about in a second. I I feel a bit disaffected with my team a lot more now than I did before, which maybe is why kind of tonight when it was all going off, yeah, I'm a little bit annoyed, but like, I'm kind of like, oh, whatever, to some extent. Like normally I can tell you like all the players in my team, what my plan is for the next few weeks off the top of my head, like without even looking, but I genuinely would struggle to name a few players in my team right now. And normally you have these stories with players of too. Well, maybe, yeah. Like, because you normally have these stories with players too. You know, you say, Oh, I've had this guy for X weeks. He's been great for me because he did this, that, and that week he did this. And, or, you know, you have the other side where you're like, Oh, I've got this cockroach in my team that I just can't get rid of. And, um, you know, the kind of Kai Havertz or Mikhail Antonio narrative. But we don't have many of those at the moment, do we? Because, like, we've been moving players in and out so much because of the context and i think losing that has diminished the sense of ownership the positive and negative that i feel that my team and players i mean i will carry on like it or not fpl is just something i do a reason to look forward to the weekend and whatnot and i'm sure i'll get some decent times again soon as i said earlier but and it's always about rolling with the punches you know not so much about despairing about how i fell off the horse but reflecting how best to get back on it um, and i think that does involve probably following you into a wild card soon anthony uh, i don't think i'm mm-hmm. doing well enough to subscribe to the the crelinator approved strategy that most people will follow i think i'm going to have to kind of use it early and try to squeeze maximum value out of it and, and maybe just maybe kind of establish a sense of ownership over my team so i feel like that's lacking and that yeah. as you just said has generating the sense of apathy but i'm still going to play um but it definitely the last couple of weeks 50 is not going my way obviously is a huge contributor but i think it's it's been a it's been a bit kind of tough to keep the psychological motivation um and uh, you know I'm, i probably won't press the button this week so we'll speak about later but i certainly am in the next couple of weeks there is definitely something in that lack of attachment that you talk about with your players some of that, I think, yeah, is to do with the fact that the sands are shifting so much and players just fly in and out of our teams much with much more regularity than usual. But I think part of it also comes with the way the fixture schedules are, for example, that because games are being called off, games are being moved, you, you just you don't necessarily kind of see your players as much as you expect to. Sometimes you, you keep seeing the same ones over and over again, and they're the ones that you <laughs> tend to be churning. And then there's some others who are just, I don't know, they just they barely almost they don't exist in your head or you don't get a chance to build an attachment because of absence as opposed to because of just fleeting yeah. presence. Um so it, maybe there's two sides to that particular coin. But it, it has been a more difficult season, as you say. I think that we are at a stage in the pandemic where um just general engagement with things, as you say, Tom, is is diminishing. And we're definitely seeing that with FPL as well. And I think maybe with FPL, especially in a season when we're speaking with people who generally follow FPL in extraordinary detail, when the season has its frustrating attributes, the the cancellations, the postponements, the random injuries, the the, the COVID outbreaks, whatever, whatever, it, it does maybe if it isn't going for you, if it isn't going your way, it's harder to maybe say, oh, I'll just fix it next week. Uh, and maybe that does make it that easier to feel frustrated and apathetic or um just maybe just disaffected in in some other way mm-hmm. um so yeah it's just it is it has been a tough season for people it's it's grand if, if you're flying high i'd imagine it just feels as good as any other time um but if you aren't uh, yeah i do feel there is a certain there's a different element to it as someone who's had like three or four bad seasons in the last six um i can kind of say that this one does feel slightly differently um to other ones um and i think it's a i think it's a pandemic feature more than anything be that in pandemic football or be that uh like even just pandemic life in general and kind of just the general malaise and erosion it's kind of caused in our i don't know appreciation of life and appreciation of what's going on <laughs> to get extremely deep yeah about. yeah I think obje- objectively um you know modern life is rubbish is definitely a, a, something that brought by blur in the 90s but perhaps there is some truth in that now but you know if things are going well for you, you are likely to kind of just be able to sideline park all of the negatives and just kind of think, you know what, at least my season's going well, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's not, then you're going to take the Rafa Benitez approach and blame external factors for why you failed rather than just missing blame or maybe, you know, maybe the Boris Johnson approach and blame other people for your issues. Um, but 
it definitely has been a challenging sort of time um, and the majority of the airways are going to be taken up the socials are going to be taken up people who are doing well at the time so I think it's just worth voicing that you know there are definitely certain elements and there are people who are still playing who who for whom it's not uh, all been swimming but there are chances for redemption if you've seen Vampany um you know oh, yeah. dusted 800k <laughs> all over the place <laughs> But I've gone from what 500 and now that live FPL is working I've gone from 572k to 347k I don't call that redemption <laughs> oh I know but it's, it's actually I know but that's, actually, that's, that's something to build on isn't it to be fair um, yeah you, I mean, didn't, you didn't have those 30, points before. To, you know rank change of 40 percent and 33 points up kind of on where I was so yeah it's like it's obviously a significant difference but at the same time yeah <laughs> one game week does not yeah, a hero uh, make maybe and, a few. and there, are, there are loads of examples of that and as i said i'll still keep playing and i think it's just about as i've said the last couple of weeks using the resources we've all got the same resources we're all feeling the same way to some extent marshaling those resources in order to kind of sort out your own particular predicament that's what i'll be doing I completely understand all these questions though why do i play this god awful game it can be incredibly frustrating but the highs and the lows they all sort of eventually uh comprise a nice season story for you and i just like seeing it through to the end if you do quit then fair play um but you know winners don't but quit. it might just comprise the storyline of like a horrific train wreck of a season well, that, that, <laughs> that is my last four seasons doing the podcast anthony so you know i'm still here just about but you know there we go i said as i pour another beer right let's move on to the next question uh so uh sir benison blankovic of uh, liverpool says here lads who do you think is the are the best free Villa assets ahead of a great run and possible double slash treble game week? And is Jacob Ramsey no longer just an enabler? Should we be starting the lad? He didn't say lad, he asks. Uh, what do you think about this, Anthony? Maybe we'll start with the Ramsey question because he's an interesting one. And obviously he, until Coutinho came off the bench, I guess, and stole the show in one sense, uh, Jacob Ramsey was stealing the show in his own way. Um, in that um, Villa Man United game. Um, indeed, Wendy had a great game too, but Jacob Ramsey was definitely very eye catching in that. And I guess when you look at his stats on a slightly longer time horizon for his value for 4.5, 4.6, he is very, like, he, he kind of stands out really in that price point, much as I might try to build a narrative around Alan. He, he is certainly uh, looking an awful lot better just from game week 12, which is when Steven Gerrard took over. Um, his XG uh, 1.17, his XA is 1.13. So you know, he's he's largely kind of on those numbers with the returns that he's had in that time, which is obviously three returns. Um, but that's fine. That's great for that value. And he does kind of, he has a bit of dynamism to him in the way, the way he plays. He's a good player to watch. He's also not your classic 4.5-ish mid midfielder who'll be, kind of putting in dirty challenges and picking up yellow cards regularly. He's just three yellow cards this season. And that's obviously a huge plus point um, when you're talking about a player that you're just hoping to get, you know, two points with the odd uh, return coming through. Like he, he kind of offers you that. Now, is he someone who you should be starting all the time? Not necessarily, but I think he is the sort of player who you would start in a double game week. Like indeed, I started Alan in the double game week um, that Everton didn't end up actually having in the end. And um, I still got an assist out of him in that so you know there is kind of something to be said for these players in double game weeks and Ramsey I think is a a very kind of good option in that just kind of looking at the data um, and also just going off kind of a trend I'd noticed he does seem to really thrive when the Villa midfield isn't being forced into pressing he seems to be somehow he is the one that the team's kind of ident- that the Villa kind of tactical outplay seems to identify as to be the extra man who gets um who's allowed to get forward and who seems to be allowed to um just drop off his defensive responsibilities and really join the attack and i think that really benefits him so against sluggish opposition who are kind of happy to leave villa take control like man united or indeed just in games where villa are able to dominate possession um i think those are the ones that he's really going to do well in and indeed quite a few yeah. of the fixtures that villa have to add to their calendar are against teams that you would expect them to uh, push around the park a bit. And so those could be games that really do suit Ramsey. And so just on Ramsey anyway, I'm pretty bullish, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think he's looking a real player in that box to box role effectively, you know, reminiscent of his namesake at Arsenal those years ago. And that, that price is simply standout. Um, 
an ideal enabler, really, as you said, for his value. The sort of player who emerges during the season and has the potential to be, you know, if FPL was repriced today, a six. 5.56 million 5. midfielder 5. 6, yeah, I'd agree um, with that, yeah. at 4.6 whatever his price tag is and I, I yeah. think I'd marginally marginally prefer to Coutinho at the moment I'm, I'm just not too sure on Coutinho at the moment um, so, cause, so Stephen Gerrard said he wasn't quite fit his goal was a tap in his assist to Ramsey was a give um, under pressure in the box but it, it, it was just kind of a sideways give uh, but I guess you know the, the sp- spectre of Lingard is hanging over so many when it comes to considering Coutinho people are looking at Coutinho thinking of Lingard last year and thinking I need to jump on this player before he just becomes the next rocket in terms of price rises and must own I just wonder I've got to just yeah, say it I'd, I'd also be surprised to see him become that rocket yeah, yeah for sure um like he had the Midas touch for 15 minutes against Man United who were shooting themselves in the foot uh and as like I said on the on the you know in the case of Ramsey like they, they won't face opposition who are so obliging and indeed Coutinho won't necessarily come on and find that his lack of fitness isn't a problem because he's playing against a team who are just stopped um no, that won't necessarily he won't have that benefit anymore could he play two games in short order in double game week I'm just not sure I think you probably you might get like kind of 60 minutes and 30 minutes which is which is probably okay it's just if you look at that compared to Ramsey at 4.6 Four point seven, mate. I think it's four point six. It's four point six. Probably going to start both. Then it's quite difficult to to make yeah. the judgment really. Um, yeah. In terms of whether there's value, but at the moment we've got a lot of money sloshing around elsewhere. Uh, Luca Dean uh, and uh, Matthias Kachowski on the other wing. Luca Dean looked. I mean, I'm not even going to bother citing his stats of one game. If anyone does, just point at them and call them a fraud. But he was on set pieces. He was pretty advanced. Looked pretty interesting. And you, Gerard's the type of style that he plays does use those advanced wing backs. Either one of Dean or Cash on what we know at the I moment think, looks I, I all right. You'd, you'd have to have Dean over Cash. I think if Dean is starting, I think you'd have to have him over Cash. Cash is underlying stats are not that good no in the not. overall scheme of things I mean, they're really not like whilst we know at least that dean has um a ball in him and indeed just has the the extra little bit of help with set pieces no, i mean there's, there's a few sh- of his uh, matt cash's shots in the box for example and pen box touches rocketed uh, when gerard took over but it feels like he's kind of unfamiliar in that sort of role at the moment whereas luca dean is the sort of player anecdotally biographically who takes an interest in his attacking stats. And he, I think he used them, I read in The Athletic, in order to get his most recent uh, contract renewal with Everton, cited his attacking stats. And I think that he'll be the sort of player who will thrive in the system. Obviously, there'll be people saying, you know, oh, Matt Target, he's still there. He may eventually get a game, but it's a tangible upgrade on Matt Target and a very big signing for them. So I wouldn't see him being supplanted by Target anytime soon. If you've watched Matt Target play, decent enough player like I wish I was him but I would also know that I would not be a, a, a player who's going to be aspiring to top six anytime soon and I'm um, just even on Matt Cash and just you know like he, okay his pen box touches might have gone up but his like his shots might have gone up a small bit since Jared took charge but like he's had I'm just looking at the, at the stats here he's had seven shots in the Gerrard era and three of those came in that game against Leicester City, where pretty much every Aston Villa player managed to get like two or three shots. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like when you when you take that out of it, you know, he's not getting forward all that much. Whereas Dina, by comparison, um, was very active and had drew one very good save out of De Gea with his feet um, in that uh, Villa United game. And I think just generally provides that little bit more. I think if I'd known for sure that he was going to be starting in the Villa team from day one, I would have put him into my wildcard team, um, Dina. Yeah. Um, but just because there was that little bit of doubt, he hadn't played yet, I wasn't going to put him in. So that's why I went for Kansa. But indeed, because I might have to transfer out Kansa, we still at this at time of broadcast, do not know uh, what his injury is going to be like. Uh, I may end up actually going to Dina in the end um, because he does provide kind of an awful lot more from an attacking perspective than any of the rest of those Villa defenders right now, I feel. Yeah, I think I'll be putting him in my wild card, I think. And I guess uh, we, we spent a lot of time talking about all the other ones, but Watkins. Yeah, I was going to say, so Watkins versus yeah. Ings. So, and Emma Martinez, but just to, just one second to mention him, he's the top actually rated goalkeeper on Mikel at the moment. But 
I, I'm not expensive. too sure about that. A bit expensive, et cetera, et cetera. I think probably Ramsdale is probably still quite decent. De Gea is still quite decent. I think there's quite a crowded field there. So I'm not too sure about that. And plus you have been, do you want to double up on Villa defence? I'm not too sure, but you might want the striker. So Watkins versus Ings then. Ings, I think, looks a bit lost. And it was telling that he was on withdrawn by Gerrard and Watkins moved central. He was Ollie Winkins for most of the game, but he did start to kind of occupy that central role after Ings was withdrawn. Dean Smith said that Watkins wasn't going to play on the wing for him because he'd been signed centre forward, but I doubt that Gerard's going to have the same hang-ups, to be honest. And looking at FBRF for stats bomb, Watkins does have the best XGI for Villa. His 7.0 non-pen XGI for the season is actually equal to the likes of Conor Gallagher and Kevin De Bruyne, which sounds okay. He's kind of on track two, so six goal involvement so far. So I broadly lean overall on this question with Watkins, probably Ramsey actually over Coutinho, but that's quite close. It depends on what the rest of your team looks like and obviously what gap you're filling. And Dean, if I was going to go with that triple Villa. Uh, one quick note, actually, to maybe not get overly into them, perhaps. I think we're all going to, so it'll be a double game week, I'm sure. But if you are the sort of person who steps back, picture battle, just late riser, keeps rabbiting on about. They record an XG of an XG per 90 of one per 80 minutes at level with the likes of Burnley. So they've been quite goal shy over the last six weeks, but hopefully it will improve given that stirring comeback against United. Who would your three be? I think just on that particular point with Villa, I think there's been like a lack of create of even attacking drive and kind of struggling to create opportunities has been a big, like a problem under Jared. And whilst they've managed to get, you know, they've done quite well results wise. Um, it's kind of something I noted, I think, on the pod after he'd like had three games. I think he might have won two out of the first three. And you found that um, he'd kind of done so against the XG head um, multiple times. Um, so it was just, it's kind of interesting that that seems to be still playing out and bringing in a much more creative uh, wing back in Dina, for example, I think will help that. I, I think just generally there's a push to try and get more out of the midfield like bringing in Coutinho has whatever about anything else managed to get the best game out of any Buendia since he signed for um, Aston Villa for example um yeah. Play so just, right. he's gone for it <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was incredible like he was it was all the it was the Amy Buendia that like sometimes turned up for Norwich remember mm. when uh, Norwich beat Man City was a 3-2 remember it was yeah. a brilliant game that was like that was the type of Amy Buendia that showed up um and it was great to see um so I think just generally you'd think that they can do okay um in these doubles and triples um in the in the future in the weeks to come of the three i I would go for it's actually probably quite similar to you watkins i'd go for ramsey as well over kajina right now and then i think i would go for dean um, on just the basis of what i've seen so far so three out of three Uh, i think we do ourselves disservice as well by not shouting over twitter that we've been calling out aston villa since last year that sounds really, really seismic when actually it wasn't very long ago. We've been saying Aston Villa for quite a while. They've had great fits in the second half of the season. If we put that on Twitter, we could be like, we discovered Aston Villa. Maybe we should probably do better there. But hey, you know what? This, this podcast is indie. They have Listen better to... fixtures and they, indeed they have lots of fixtures. <laughs> exactly. But they're not Burnley, are they? Right. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Praz, FPL. Good old mate, Pros. We're a nice guy, actually. Asks if Jota is the one to make way for Salah in 24, or is he still a hold? And for me, considering a wild card, should he make it into that wild card team at all? Let's start with the obvious. Jota is a stats monster. He's clear second for non pen expected goal involvement this season. Um, I don't think he was very far behind Salah when I looked at it. I think Salah had like 17 and Jota had 15, and he's got a superior non pen SGI on a per 90 basis than Salah does um, and he's also behind shockingly his actual stats versus his expected so it's 11 proper in goal 11 proper goal involvements and one additional FPL assist so 11 versus 15 or 12 versus 15 depending on what you do very high ownership as well and Liverpool's next four before the next blank before the next blank looks all right the real problem I guess if you're considering a wild card like I am and or looking to freshen up your midfield is that I'd suggest the emerging midfield five is Salah, a Man City midfielder, Foden potentially, Rafinha, Bowen, and a Villa midfielder, so Ramsey or Coutinho. 
And you've also got to consider Maxwell Cornet potentially, because Burnley are going to have a hell of a lot of games. But that that's probably one to sideline. I think Salah, Foden, Rafinha, Bowen, and Raf- Ramsey slash Coutinho, that's probably the midfield five that you'll be looking at. And you'll be thinking, where does Jota slot in? I think that's a question we'll all be asking. You could, for example, go double defence. So Robertson's looked back on it recently. And the last time Jota got the double digit hall was Anthony. Do you remember? Uh, the week I didn't have him. Um, <laughs> what one was that? <laughs> that? It actually feels like it was quite a bit ago at this point. Maybe Thanks, uh, sometimes before Christmas. Mm. Game, uh, week, the game week 13. The 20th, wow. Was 20th, that, like, no, that could even have been November. Yeah, 27th of November. So that was oh, the last wow. time he got double digit hall. So there's an yeah. argument that he I won't was... hurt you at all. I was killed that week. So was, yeah. yeah. So will I do it on wild cards if I wild card this one next week? I'm not sure, honestly, but it's hard to see at the moment, apart from maybe Rafinha out of that midfield five I mentioned, how he's going to fit in. I, mean, I do have a lot of cash tied up in him. So maybe I'll carry him through to not throw the baby out of the bath water and expose, to my, expose myself to an EO disaster like you just mentioned. Would I sell him for Salah? Uh, I'd be tempted, but probably once we've got the lay of the lamb post Leicester in game with 24, so I'm not sure I'd go early with that. But one thing that I do expect is for him to fall out of the template slowly but surely, uh, pending any double game with news, of course. I think that blank in game 27 is probably going to be when he starts to kind of ebb away a little bit. So I think short term, probably persist. The stats are very good. The underlying data is worth him having a little bit of pa- worth having a little bit of patience with him. But I think long term, the midfield is probably quite clear. And it might not be that Joss is going to be there any that much longer. Yeah, you see, the thing is, is that I just don't feel like we're feeling this way if Shata puts away the you know the the one particularly guilt-edged opportunity that he had against Brentford, missed one particular sitter, or XG of zero point nine in that game. Like that's a that's a massive XG not to return on. It's just kind of just it highlights. I know you've said it in <laughs> it's been many happening a lot. Though, how much of a stat monster? Yeah, how much of a stat monster he is. But the problem is, is that especially in that Liverpool team who are still creating away nicely while Salah is absent and when he returns will con- you know will c- continue it seems to be um quite good going forward because they kind of need to make up for the defense regressing a small bit um with that in mind uh, like I I'm he's not going to be going anytime soon I don't know if Salah is even going to necessarily be back um <laughs> by 24 like i'm kind of yeah. he will be back by 24 he will because the afghan will be finished by then but only just if it's um, pre- the final is three days before game 24 so I, 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 and it, it, egypt don't i've only seen little bits but egypt do not look like a team that's going to make the final of afghan mm-hmm. for what it's worth mm-hmm. um be a shock um but they do of course have mo salah so you know but it's mo salah they, they all scream at the afghan uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you never know but um, with that in mind, it's kind of like at least you would expect that um, Jota will kind of still be a feature, as you say, of the template for another few weeks. I don't necessarily think that I'd want to get rid of him anytime soon. Certainly, certainly not. Um, ahead of like let's say game week twenty, you know, twenty five for example, they're against Burnley. Burnley away, that's a pretty decent fixture. The Leicester game in twenty four indeed is a good fixture too, considering Spurs even managed to score three on them. And then it's Norwich in twenty six. Like these are all the sorts of games that um you're going to want to be doubled up in that Liverpool attack for. So I suspect he will, as you say, Tom, stay in the template until the blank comes. Yeah. Okay. So don't sell in time soon. Maybe yeah, after twenty four. Maybe it, after twenty five. Just have a look at it. No, not but... not after twenty five or twenty four. <laughs> Keep it. <laughs> I think about maybe when you've got the lie of the land. Norwich. Twenty four. Twenty five. Norwich. Yeah. They, yeah. They have they have to outscore Adam Eda. So like, <laughs> do you know, pressure is going to be on that day. Right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Speaking about outscoring Adam Eda, Man City as a whole, um, even Edison they have, probably, they have indeed outscored. Adam I'm, I'm, Eda. I'm sure. I'm sure even Ad, even Edison would if he was a striker in the game. Um, no. sec, second City defender slash asset generally. So Euro FPL Dan, I think a, a, a countryman of yours actually. I think he's an Irishman. So yes. Yep. Yep. 
asked for a discussion on a second City defenders after Cancelo. Maybe that's chat midfielders too. Let's assume we're going to leave off the fixation on Jesus. Is that that's that's finished now, right? That's, can, that's gone. You've crucified that. Yeah. We can roll the boulder in front of the cave. It's finished. It's uh, done. Put it back. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're yeah, four we'll, days we'll on. We'll put that for yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, I, I think this is an interesting one. I, I, I Cancelo actually shockingly was no wasn't a ghost at 150k at the start of the game week he wasn't a shrug either uh surely he's on his way there soon i think i saw his both our bus captains this week <laughs> from mccrelly as well so um, i think the, the question arises i'm not going to wax through a quote cancello you all own him if you're a serious fpl manager like, do you have an fpl if you don't own cancello the question really is about who to compliment him with and i know i see you went with laporte and he's got the fifth highest XG amongst defenders over the last six. A few shots in the box, decent amongst bonus as well. He be, basically he played last year. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but he he probably be my <laughs> defensive double up pick. I think there's no no other way around it. Um, the, the, other wise, way, the way around it, I think, is is Ederson. Yeah. Oh, um, oh. Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, I I don't think. Um, I, like okay, you can make arguments for Diaz, for example, but he's just so much more. Um, and it seems like he's as rotation prone as, as Laporte is at the moment. Don't jinx it, please. Uh, <laughs> so please, for the love of God, don't jinx it, Pep. But uh, it does seem like Laporte just offers like a good value um, intro into there compared to DS at six point three, and then yeah, the rest the rest of the city defenders they're just not that interesting. Like they're just not they're not getting the returns nor the minutes to make them worth kicking. So yeah, Laporte's this year's stones isn't and. Stones was the year before the Laporte, like it was a rotation, but Laporte has kept his place. Uh, yeah, meritocracy. Like, Stones could quite easily, like, uh, yeah, I, I think Stones could have his day yet, <laughs> to be honest. This yeah, season he, five point two, but he, he, it, could. he even played at the weekend um, and did very well. But, yeah. um, so you just don't know. Could, could you keep out keep out Diaz yeah, now? You, you just don't you just don't know, do you? Um, oh, yeah. I guess midfield Maybe. wise. I guess midfield wise though, I, it's got to be Foden. I think. I mean, he's eleventh overall this season for non pen SGI on stats bomb. Decent price, and I I think I'll draft him in soon. Maybe even this week. A solid caps two option for the next two. So perhaps in Brentford, just behind him in the SGI non pen SGI stats that is Sterling and Jesus. Uh, I mean, and KDB as well, rearing his head's luxury placeholder for Salah uh, in mind for many uh, versus Southampton. Just to reference, Sterling has got 11 returns in 17 games. So you know, that could be fairly interesting. 3.7% ownership and his XGI of last six is level with Jota too. And the next three, Southampton, Brentford, Norwich. Very good for City. Obviously, no doubles as it stands, so that's hard to look past. But one note of caution before I just hand the microphone back to you, Anthony. Norwich in game with 25, the game we'll all be looking to buy City for, is just before the next round of the Champions League. After Norwich, they play, they face Sporting Lisbon, Spurs, Everton, United and Sporting. So you probably need to be thinking that that Norwich game is going to be rotation central. Is that news? No, because it's Pep. <laughs> yeah, it's like, is that the game that Foden does play or doesn't play? <laughs> because like he's rotating in and out of that team so much that um, if you are buying Foden, it's spend your 8 million, close your eyes, hope for the best. And it could be brilliant. It could be absolutely terrible. Uh, if I was to pick, I've been fairly consistently pro Foden of the City midfielders all the way through. I think I'll continue to be that way. I think in terms of just raw points, I, I do think actually that Sterling is going to outscore him over the next, let's say, five, six, seven, eight game weeks. But uh, the reality is, is that he's just too much money. Uh, and that's why, at the end of the day, Foden kind of wins out the race um, for me. If, if I was answer, like it's, it's, there's no real good way to skin this. No, path. no, no, no. There's absolutely. no point trying to pull the detail out. There's no point trying to, to quote you stats. Foden is good when he plays. It's just will he play. If I was dead ending this week, which I might well be, I might consider bringing in Sterling, captaining him, and then on my actual wild cards, the the, the short term fling is Sterling because of the price, and Kevin De Bruyne indeed because of the price. The long term kind of relationships probably with Foden because of the price too. The price commensurate with the risk. It's all priced in Anthony, as you know well. I don't think it is actually for Sterling. It's really not. No, 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 no. For 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 for, <laughs> for, 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 for Foden. Okay. okay, I was like, "Rot." Yeah, it 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 is somewhat priced in with Foden for sure at eight point oh. The score of five goals this season. It's it's definitely priced in. A frustrating one, but yeah, probably the best of the midfield picks, nevertheless. 
Uh, all right. So anyway, yeah, move on from the city questions because we could really get ourselves uh, in all sorts of twists and tangles talking about who will play and who won't play. But in truth, we don't know. So we'll move to something that we might know something about uh, to a question from Harry Alexander, who is talking about hits. And he's basically saying, with lower total scores in recent weeks, should we be more adverse to taking hits rather than demonstrating the gung-ho behavior of recent times? So having had multiple podcasts, Tom, where we discussed how taking lots of hits is the way forward all of a sudden it seems like fpl has done another 180 and it seems that a bit of conservatism small c conservatism we stress uh, given tom's intro um <laughs> has is um is small c conservatism the way to go now in fpl tom or uh are we over laboring the point and should we be continuing to take hits it's the age-old gamble with hits. And as I alluded to earlier on, if all the hits that I had taken, and as we spoke about, all the hits I had taken did lead to massive outcomes, which were amazing for me, I'd be sat here going, yeah, you know what? My hits have been fantastic. I love my team. Admittedly, I still am not particularly, I don't particularly care about them, but I've had a great time with them. I can make some crude joke about one night stands I'm not going to, uh, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, And I think that, you know, it's always the way that if you take a gamble of hits, if they pay off your genius, if they don't, you're a, they're a huge down weight on your score. This week, it's obviously not worked for me. Last week, I sort of did because I had Bowen, Caps Antonio, so it could have worked. I've taken big hits for the likes of Martinelli. Like, if, if anything, like, Tom, it was it was actually being too conservative with your hits that got you. If you'd oh, been yeah, like, yeah. you know what, I'll just get Bruno in. Screw it. You know, yeah, like yeah. that was the difference, wasn't it? You know, it's like... You yeah, can't, yeah. Can't, it's, 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 no point flaying yourself over it. It made a lot of sense. No, no, I, I, it does. But at it, the same, it, it's just it's an interesting kind of thought that if you don't, it, it was on your mind as something that you could do, but it was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. I've run out already. No, so, it, it, it it wasn't on my. It wasn't on like it. It wasn't deep in the consideration set. If you see what I mean, it yes, was on yes, the, yeah. the wide consideration it was, set. It was. It was in the. Oh, that's that's too many hits. It was an, it was an option of something I could do, but there was no way it was in the narrow sort of down end of the funnel of actual final decisions that I had to make. It just, it just wasn't in my in my wheelhouse really to do it. Um, no, this week didn't work, but if you do have players who aren't playing, I still maintain it's genuinely not the worst thing to do to remove those players for players who are going to be playing, who could bang. And I know you want to compare on a one-week basis, but there's a huge advantage of removing the devil from your team and hiding it too in a bad week. And if you don't I guess the problem is if you don't get the power from those newbies, it's, it only deepens the ditch you find yourself in, like I found this week. But I don't know. In, in response to in response to Harry's question, it's an arguable that if you have no hits taken at the moment, you're starting up and everybody else. That's clear. I've done all right with my hits thus far this season. That's documented on the last pod. I think probably slightly more breaking even now than I used to be. I think I was probably about kind of in the teens up, whereas last pod I was kind of in the high 20s up. But I guess overall, it's probably still best to take no hits at all. Uh, I think that's probably still true. I think I'm probably on the other side of this, and I'm just thinking, just power on, keep going, take the hits, take the risks. Like, I took the wild card this week. Um, I could... Uh, I could have got something close enough to my starting 11 in terms of who delivered the main points with taking about a minus eight. And it would have been what I'd have done had I not gone for the wild card, I guess. So I, I've spent so much of this season yeah. being burnt by being too careful and avoiding taking hits and just kind of watching all of the points buses just go flying by as I stand there kind of insisting that Saka will come good and then selling him before he came good. Um, it's It's just one of these you'll always be able to develop a counterfactual narrative yeah. pro or anti hits. And th right now the, the story of the season that I've had is that taking hits uh, continue and taking risks is the way to go because just being careful hasn't worked, but I totally can understand how if you were in a position where your team was delivering well and you're going along nicely and you don't want to just blow up your team accidentally by, you know, playing the odds a little bit, then it makes a huge an abundance of sense to do nothing and just be very careful and not take hits. Because as Tom said, like you are just shooting yourself in the foot at the start of the game week and kind of hoping that you discover penicillin and fly forward. <laughs> well, it's got a feet transplant, something like that in my case. But hey, 
there you go it's all very outcome dependent sadly see back to outcome bias pods i think it was probably two seasons ago now dear me right final question this week the final questions this week are on chip chat Paul Pryor and James at FPL JMO writing about their chips. So Paul asks, how patient should we be given how many games are still being postponed when it comes to our chips? Is it still the case we should be trying to fill the team wherever we can and hold our chips back for the future? And James asks specifically on the free hit chip, should, should we be wielding them in the blank as is the received wisdom uh, as options are likely to be diminished, diminished into picks we will basically have anyway, or you know, should we just kind of still stick to this? So, as mentioned, I'm thinking of wild carding soon. I'm packing my team with players who have fixed in hands. Uh, you know, if I do do it, I'm going to use chips to navigate the game weeks coming up and free hit, probably do some transfers or whatever. But have the spread of quality to do the job. Like next week, I'm going to do it game of 24, so I can buy Salah back amongst other things. Uh, chip wise to answer Paul's question yes unfortunately COVID related postponements aren't quite a thing in the past just yet I think there's definitely some light at the end of the tunnel with where that's kind of concerned but I can see why cautious managers are holding their nerve and arguably kind of just thinking the risk of disaster is slightly higher at the moment so it's worth just holding those chips back if you hate risk I think just making these sort of uh, uh, moves is, is not really for you basically before we move on to James free hit question and Anthony you you did wild card this week and just talk us through sort of the logic behind doing that and taking something slightly early i know kind of i think the main sort of uh the school of thought is that you use your free hits in game at 27 the game we first you won you wild card off and you wild card sort of around sort of 35 ahead of that kind of 36 big double so between game 31 and 35 obviously and you your triple triple captain probably on Mo Salah at some point in the future why do you wild card early um can you convince me to do so i'm really going to do so but you know just just for posterity my team was crap. Like th- that was the main reason I had to wildcard. I can uh, try and orate that in extensive, complex ways, or I can just put it bluntly. The team was not good. And there were just too many things that needed to be done to fix it. And I was constantly chasing this template that I had managed to leave fly by me, never quite getting to the template, but also never getting ahead of the template or picking any, making any sensible picks because I was always fixing some stupid fire that had me caught that meant that I couldn't, um, in terms of budget or whatever, just move the money around to get the players that I wanted any given week. And it just, it had spiraled to the point that it was just pull the trigger on the wild card, start to try and play this on my own terms again and see how it did for me. It's worked out for one week. Let's see how many, how many more weeks it works out for. Um, that leaves me now with a, free hit the bench boost and the triple captain left to go um i've used one of my free hits i used it to disastrous effect over christmas at one point or another um the free hit will be kept for the giant blank game week that is to come Uh, i'm hoping that whilst covid postponements probably are not a historical artifact just yet i'm somewhat optimistic that they won't scupper a game week uh, like they have done i just it kind of seems like that's just no longer allowed (laughs) done done so with that in mind i'm optimistic that i can get away with that as my method of getting through the free hit with the free hit the bench boost i suspect i'll use it in one of the double game weeks that comes up where i just feel that i have you know a decent number of doubling players uh, and a decent bench that's there probably with quite a few single game week players i'm not going to do too many silly things to try and bend my squad to get you know 15 double game weekers or anything like it to be honest i'd say i'll have seven or eight or nine all the main ones ticked off and then maybe my my zag in the double game weeks will be the single game week players that i end up keeping uh the be- and then the triple captain yeah as you say tom it'll probably just be on mosala at some point um uh, probably a week that he blanks and um uh, and i look forward to that immensely uh, and that's kind of how I'll, I'll navigate it. I'll probably take an EO hit at some point um, on double gaming players that I don't own and that I zag against. But that's that's the risk you have to take when you don't save yourself the wild card to navigate those final doubles and blank, doubles and yeah. blanks that tend to come at the end of the season. It just does seem like those are going to be slightly more forgiving than usual, um, purely on the base. There are so many fixtures that need to be slotted in. I don't suspect we're going to have like the 
it, we're gonna we'll have the one decimated blank game week, the annual affair. But otherwise, I'm not so sure we're going to have any blank game week that really would cause me to tear off my team. We will have a mega double at some point, but usually you find with the doubles that there's the seven or eight players you really want, and after that you start to fill your teams with. Uh, Shane Duffy's and whoever else's that you know we all think are Max Gradle or whoever that we think is going to be good and then <laughs> turns out to be just nowhere near good enough um for the given given week or Junior Stanislaus. I don't know why I'm picking yeah, up I, I, I was literally just about to say Junior yeah, Stanislaus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Junior Stanislaus, Stanislaus or Roberto oh, Firmino or Christian Benteke or Alvaro Negredo or yeah <laughs> Ben Gibson. Yeah, all these d- different characters that we might bring in um for double game weeks, but in the in the overall scheme of things um I, i'm not too concerned that the double game weeks will annihilate me it can't get much worse than it's been already put it that way it, it goes without saying that if you are doing well i think just following the anointed strategy will be absolutely fine for you um because neither of us are doing as well as we want to be using some sort of um differential zagging strategy tends to suit our where we are but um if you are doing well that that kind of strategy i mentioned earlier on which was everywhere you should if you're an engaged manager you'll probably know it right now it makes a lot of sense frankly uh, to come on to james's question about free hit actually i think this is interesting because i think defensive versus offensive free hits are what we need to think on really so playing a free hit in a blank is undoubtedly defensive uh, blanks incoming which is the most fpl relevant barring a few bryson and chelsea ones bryson are kind of in the fpl meta chelsea are not at the time of recording are 27 and there's a big one that i've mentioned is it coming up i think it's 30 um fa cup quarter finals that week so 27 30. so 27 uh, might be 27 is looking like it's going to be that's one uh, Ar- that's one with arsenal and liverpool principally out um correct yeah so that one and could be quite offensive couldn't it? Um, and Chelsea and Leicester. Yeah. I mean, okay. Leicester, some of maybe Madison or hanging around. But that could be quite good because you've got a potential chance to load up on other teams elsewhere, move on the likes of Salah, who were alone by then, Trent for one week and have an optimal team for that week. Whereas those not free hitting are operating on a diminished budget. So that could be fairly decent in terms of a, a free hit use. Game week 30 when you, you're saying you're going to use it and probably where I'll use it as well if I do wildcard soon, it's going to be totally defensive. You'll be picking up the key mem from the fix being played and non-free hitters will be doing exactly the same. So those not free hitting where it picks up the same players as you and you're relying on the off-the-wall differentials, the Maxwell Cornets of the world to do the job, aren't you really? I guess it would come down to the other five or six players you can pick up, assuming everybody covers the same of five or six. It's probably going to be like Martinelli versus Saka and uh, Trossard versus Mope. Like these are the sorts of things, these are the sorts of arguments that are, are yeah, Watkins versus yeah. Ings and this sort of stuff. Like those are going to be the the differentials yeah you're, you're expo- exposing yourself to wild wild variants in one week there's no other way to put it you are just kind of leaving your fate in the hands of the gods and hoping that everything turns out okay gains are certainly there there to be had in defensively and offensively free hitting i do like the idea of offensively free hitting as james is probably inferring a little bit actually so you know on a dodgy week where you were low on options you have an injury or two a short-term rule out due to covid for example you want to retain but take advantage of your fixtures about transfers but that could be fairly decent like that, that, that i think over christmas on um not Boxing Day, but the week the weekend after that, or the game week after that, because I have family coming around, not my family, indoors coming around. I did the free hit then, and I gained a lot of points on the on the average. You can do it in a normal week. I'm not suggesting you can. I mean, we had two game two free hits this year, so if you got two, you can be frivolous. You could even go to game week thirty eight and use your free hit. Then I'm not sure. It's always always I've got to make the really boring point for a hand the mic to Anthony. Highly team dependent. It's highly rant dependent. So you've got to factor in what makes more sense for you, Anthony. I think largely to be honest that you're better off saving the free hit for the defensive move to just protect yourself in the silly wipeout blank game weeks that's largely what i feel because otherwise usually the teams that aren't playing in those blank game weeks are good teams who have managed to progress in the fa cup and it's players from good teams that you tend to have in your fpl team so if you're trying to navigate a blank game week 
when all the good players in your team who play for good teams aren't playing, it's going to be quite difficult. And there's no getting around that. Now, when there are two free hits, yes, you do, as Tom kind of has indicated there, have maybe a little bit more of a chance to use one of your free hits in an attacking or aggressive or whatever way you wish to say. But overall, I, I think I would just skew towards them as a defensive um, as a defensive chip that just kind of just allows you to kind of hold rank and just get through an awkward week that's affecting everybody um, when everyone is indeed in the same boat. Mm. That one time when it happens. Okay, well, move on to chances and captains this week. As I said, timestamp this Wednesday night. You probably are all excited about a double game week. We simply don't know about this right now. Um, so just to quickly do this, I'm not sure if I wildcard this week. I need more news, obviously, on the doubles, which you may know about. Uh, but I'm minded to go in game week 24 and just dead end into this week to some extent. I've got an eye on bringing Foden or Sterling in. Uh, Sterling would be the ultimate dead end captain, probably a Villa defender for Michael Bloody Kane. I, I, literally, I, I could use a hit to sell him, buy him back and sell him again. That's how, that's how annoying uh, he is. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Uh, so I probably would probably look at bringing in Sterling for one of my midfielders, potentially. God knows if I can even do it. Um, and probably a Villa defender. Um, I've actually got a bit of a benching headache this week <laughs> without a double. So I've got Martinelli, Saka, both have got Burnley, Madison at home to Brighton, Bowen away from Man United, but there's nowhere I'm benching him at the moment, especially because Man United can't defend. Jota, Dennis, Ronaldo and Watkins, who all need to play, but one needs to be benched. And at the moment, it's actually Watkins without a double who's on the bench. But if, if a double does come in, then life becomes incredibly difficult and making transfers here becomes incredibly difficult. So maybe I just do, you know, Keane to Dean and just have uh, Watkins and uh, Dean as my doubles if they do get a double. I don't even know. A captain is Boston Cancelo at the moment with Trent Vice. It's a very open week for it, I think. It could go anywhere. I'll see what Mikel says in terms of my objectives, but even that looks largely uncertain currently. So I might have to rely on my, my own intuition, which sounds like a very, very scary thought. I don't want that. So hopefully there's an obvious captain. Captaining and Watkins if Villa get a double game week. Wow. It's just saying the words just make me quiver in... What's the opposite of anticipation? Apprehension. Oh, God. But that could be the way it goes. Who knows? How are you, Anthony? Things are kind of set up okay for me for this coming um, game week slash double game week. Um, viewers who are on the YouTube can see. For those who can't see, I'm set up. Um, right now, I'm going to play De Gea and goals ahead of Foster, even though Foster's at home to Norwich. I have a little bit of thinking to do about that because much as De Gea is in good form and making great saves he because of United's defence still isn't actually keeping that many clean sheets it's just four for the season which is actually ridiculous um, when you consider just how much United have put into that defence in terms of money or whatever so I might actually end up playing Foster even if he is facing Adam Ida, um this coming weekend then my defence I have Trent Alexander-Arnold I have Kansa starting at the moment hoping that he's there for a what I would hope is a double game week and then I am starting both Cancelo and Laporte with Veltman being the defender that gets benched um, when he's playing away to Leicester. So I, I'm, just, I'm quite optimistic about that City game away to Southampton that uh, they might uh, return those clean sheets again in that particular fixture. Cancelo is the one that I currently have my armband on. That is mostly for lack of trust in my attackers as opposed to anything else that I just feel like at least with City and with Cancelo, there's a decent chance of a clean sheet coming through, basically a one and two chance. And then there is also a pretty decent shout of attacking returns there. That's why it's on him so far. But at the same time, I think maybe a transfer might be required just to give myself a captain. In the meantime, my midfield has Jared Bowen, Diogo Jota, Rafinha and Bruno Fernandes. And up top, I have both Ronaldo and Emmanuel Dennis. Dennis could be a shout for the captaincy um, at home to Norwich. Be a bit of a shout of relegation, six pointer between the two of those. Um, what I might, I, I'm some Harry Kane having one good game makes me wonder if uh, turfing out Ronaldo and bringing in Harry Kane would be the fun alternative pick of the week. Um, the Spurs are playing Chelsea. Chelsea, okay, was obviously have been quite good um, defensively as a whole this season. They have not been that good defensively recently. And 
Antonio Conte's Spurs just have a bit of a grit to them that um, is definitely starting to show in results and even it's starting to show in Kane performances. So uh, there's kind of just some part of me is quite interested in having him in my side and that could be an interesting uh, you know what? to bring him in. And Kane, him. Was, Kane was running at defenders with the ball at his feet. And, and then passed them, and then the defender didn't catch up. Yeah, well. exactly. That, that's that's yeah. well, it's, re- well. it's true, it's remarkable. Um, so with that in mind, um, just to be a little bit more interested in him than I've had, um, certainly for a long time this season. But right now, the captaincy remains on Cancelo. Uh, it's just there isn't really like a clear fixture that you want to attack with like an elite player this game week. Like the Liverpool game at Crystal Palace is one that you, you know, you would expect to be excited about, but like, there's no way I can trust Jota um, in that particular fixture with the armband. I don't think. And do I want to go again on the Trent wagon? I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I, I kind of feel like Palace just have a bit of a sense of inevitability that they won't be held scoreless um, at home. And so I don't know if I want to test that. And then I'm not sure if I want to go, in some sort of alternative punt on the likes of Bowen at Man United, even if United can't defend. And I'm not sure if I want to go with like a Bruno or just one of those elite players either, just because they're elite. Because frankly, if you, if Bruno Fernandes and Ronaldo play against West Ham, United probably won't score at all, uh, which is why I'm entertaining the prospect of selling Ronaldo ahead of that fixture, even if United's fixtures beyond that are actually very, very, very good with Burnley, Southampton, Leeds and Watford. Um, so much to think about, really, and quite a lot of it will depend on the double game week. If Villa get their double game week, I will strongly, strongly consider bringing in Watkins and maybe fixing Kansa if he proves to actually be injured, as it stands right now. I just don't have enough information on it. So, yeah, I think that brings us to the end of this particular uh, midweek podcast we hope you enjoy thanks so much for listening we were who got the assist if you want to send in correspondence then you can do so by emailing who got the assist at gmail.com if you want to watch us rather than listen to us just go onto youtube um, it's a pretty large website and you just type wgta in the search bar and then hit enter um, or you can just hit the little magnifying glass button to search and then uh, we'll be the first videos there and you can then watch uh, slightly less edited uh, versions of the podcast um, there yeah indeed thanks so much for listening we'll speak to you ahead of next game week at some point i'm working next monday night annoyingly so it's likely to be a midweek edition Maybe even at the end of the week, the drink is an IB. Who knows? Let's go mad, Anthony. It is a party vibe after after all. In the meantime, hope to see you. Speak to you very, very soon. Good luck this weekend. And yeah, we'll speak to you before long. Goodbye.